This is a talk about how to hack every school in the world with an asterisk. Asterisk. As a child, I was always fascinated by the asterisk. Following it on the back of a bottle of ripe tomato ketchup, we could find out that the tomatoes were anything but ripe. Or on the back of real mango juice, we could find out that the real was just a brand name. I love the asterisk because it felt like we were learning forbidden knowledge, knowledge that we weren't supposed to know. Knowledge is powerful. I'm going to propose a situation to you. We have a person who has stumbled upon something. It's a nuclear bomb. <laughs> they don't know how it works. They don't know what it is. They don't know how to launch it. We have someone else. This person is very similar, but they don't have a nuclear bomb. In fact, what they do have is knowledge. They have the knowledge of who to talk to, what to ask for, what materials to build it out of, and they know how to launch it. I would say the person who's more powerful is the second person, the person with the knowledge. You know, there's a story that goes that the U.S. launch codes used to be zero 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 because they thought the Soviets would start guessing at zero 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 one. Now, of course, we'll never find out if that's true because the military would never tell us that. It's classified. It's forbidden knowledge. Knowledge is powerful. I want to tell you another story. This is a story about a pair of hackers. Actually, not hackers, but freakers. Freakers. Freakers were an earlier form of hackers, and the word freakers is weird. It's freak, but with a ph, like for phone, telephone. Before we can understand what our hackers were up to, I think we need a little history lesson on telephones. Early telephone systems were much simpler. They worked like this. You would pick up your phone, and you'd be talking to an operator. The operator would ask you who you wanted to call, and then physically connect your wire to the correct place. This is a little inefficient, and the phone companies knew this. And over time, they started to make their systems more advanced. They replaced the human operators with machines, and these machines would automatically switch your connection to the correct place. But there's a problem. How would the how would the machine know where your call was supposed to go? How would your phone communicate the phone number you want to call down the wire? The phone lines were only designed for transmitting audio. Well, the phone companies came up with an ingenious solution. Using the properties of sound, sound can come in different frequencies. They can be higher pitched and lower pitched. So instead of trying to figure out how to transmit extra data, why don't we just encode that data as sound and transfer it down the wire? And this works well. This works very well. If you've ever pressed the keypad on your phone and you've heard a sound, that's a legacy of dial tones. And these dial tones were powerful, and the phone companies started to use them internally. So within a phone system, there would be multiple systems talking to, to each other over these dial tones, and the, they would communicate things like whether a call had ended, if someone had paid at a payphone, if a call was to a restricted phone number. But this begs the question. What if you could somehow pick up a phone and then generate the right frequency sound and play it down the speaker? What would happen? Well, this guy found out that a breakfast cereal toy he got it would generate a frequency of exactly 2,600 hertz, which was the frequency used by payphones to indicate a, a call had ended. He was then free to make international calls to anywhere in the world for free. He was one of the first freakers. So back to our pair of hackers, our pair of freakers. They thought this was interesting. They decided to tinker. They decided to experiment, and they made this little blue box. And this box connected to a speaker, and they could dial numbers on the box, and it would generate the right frequency sound. They later went on to start、uh, a business, and and they they sold these, and they continued to be business partners for a while. They started a company, and you might have heard of it. It's called Apple. <laughs> this is Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the co-founders of Apple. And you could argue that it was this little blue box, this desire to innovate, this desire to experiment, this desire to break things, that led to the creation of revolutionary technology. So that leads me to my first lesson to you as a hacker: you have to be willing to be curious. You have to be willing to break things. You have to be willing to experiment. You have to be willing to tinker. The Oxford Dictionary defines a hacker as this: a person who uses a computer to gain unauthorized access to data, which, sure, might be true. But I want to expand your horizons. I want to show you a different perspective. I want to show that hackers don't have to be bad people. In fact, lots of people hack for good. So I'm going to redefine hacker for you. It's going to be someone who does something to make something do something it was never meant to do. A very vague definition for a deservingly vague word. 
So, when I was seven, I began learning how to code. I don't know, something about computers drew me to them. I loved making them do things. I loved making little games. I made little websites. I made little toys. I just loved tinkering. I loved experimenting. A couple years ago, three, four years ago, I had a lot of free time for some reason. <laughs> and in this free time, I learned a new skill. I learned how to hack, but, but for good. So before I explain how that works, I think we need a little history, we need a little lesson on how computers, the internet, the web works. That's your computer. And on your computer, you should only be able to access data that belongs to you. That is a web server. They, trans they handle the data for every user. And therefore, on a web server, there's access to lots of data, everyone's data. And you connect to the web server over the internet. It's a little bit simplified. Uh, but when you connect over the internet, you should only be able to access data from a web server that you're meant to get. So this is an example. This is a website. And uh, that is the URL, the Uniform Resource Locator. It tells you use it on your computer to tell a web server what data you want to access. At the end of our URL, we have a number. That number, in this case, is some kind of identifier. It's a user ID. What if I change that number? Would it let me access someone else's data? This is the whistling down the phone line of the web. So I said that hackers can be good, and I want to expand on that. A hacker doesn't have to be a bad person. Yes, there are hackers in basements who hack people, or nation states who want to access the data of their enemies. But hackers can be someone who experiments, who tinkers, and who someone who reports bugs for good. They find vulnerabilities in websites and report them securely to the companies and get them fixed. In fact, lots of companies realize this. They run what's called bug bounty programs, essentially programs where they work with security researchers around the world, people like me or you, maybe, and they, um, they, they allow them to report bugs, explain what the impact of the bug is, and then they sometimes reward them. It sounds counterintuitive, but this is so much better than the past, where someone might be a good Samaritan and find a vulnerability, but the company responds with legal threats and they get sent to jail. This is a win-win situation. The companies get bugs fixed, and the people who can demonstrate their skills get paid. Last year, I was working on a project for design. It's a little screen, and on the screen, I display information about the class. Uh, it has a time, and teachers can write little comments um, so that they can say what's going on in the class. I also wanted to include the timetable. See on the screen, it shows the current class using the room. And I wanted this information to update automatically. But this begs the question, how does my screen get that data? Well, for one, I could ask the school for it, but I didn't really want to. <laughs> They could say no, they could take time. That didn't really interest me. <laughs> I could also transcribe it by hand. You see, there's a, there's a physical timetable right next to it. I could spend, what, like six minutes trying to just write that into code? But there's a saying. They say, never spend six minutes doing something by hand when you can spend six hours failing to automate it. <laughs> so I began working. My school uses a platform. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to call it Backpack. <laughs> On this platform, my teachers assign me homework. Uh, I can see my grades. I also have my timetable. So Backpack has my timetable, and I have it in, in, in code. They have it in some kind of computer-readable format. This is perfect. But how do I access it? Well, I'm looking for an API, an application programming interface, which sounds scary, but don't worry. An API isn't isn't necessarily a bad, scary thing. It's just how two computer programs talk to each other. Lots of websites have public APIs. They let anyone access data. Uh, a few that come to mind is YouTube, Facebook. Facebook got in trouble for that. Uh, and uh, Instagram, for example. But Backpack does not have a public API. There's no way for me to write code that integrates with their services, is what you think. You see, they have an iPad app. And on this app, I can. Uh, view my, my timetable, for example. That means the app has to be loading that data from their website somehow. They're using an API. So how can I access that? Well, I thought, thought about it for a while. <laughs> and I did what's called a man-in-the-middle attack. You might have seen this on uh, an ad for a VPN, or on a TV show, or on a movie. 
Usually, this is a bad guy in a coffee shop watching everyone type their passwords into their bank accounts. That's not me. I'm not looking for my own password. I'm on my own home internet, and I'm just intercepting the traffic between my iPad and the web server for Backpack. What I want to do is I want to see how that protocol work, works. I want to see how that API works, and if I can try integrating that into my own code for my screen project. But there was a problem. You see, the reason why VPNs aren't that useful or that bad guys in coffee shops can't just go download everyone's passwords is everything's encrypted nowadays. There's encryption on the iPad, and there's encryption on the web server. So I can sit in the middle, but I'm not accessing anything. It's unfortunate. I gave up. Failure is inevitable. Success isn't a straight line. Is what you would think, because you see, Backpack integrates with another service called Testinator. And when I went to Testinator, I noticed I was already logged in with my Backpack account. It said my name at the top. So that led me to think, somehow, Backpack is able to talk to Testinator. Testinator is able to access my data from Backpack. So can I get my data from Testinator somehow? Backpack was very secure. I wasn't able to find an API. I wasn't able to get my data. But Testinator, on the other hand, has a couple holes in its wall. And when I say a couple, I mean a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I started looking at uh, Testinator's code. And within a few minutes, I noticed something. I could get information about my school. I could see how many students visited. Um, I could get information about you know, the head of the school, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I was also able to access data about every other school that used Testinator. That's a lot of schools. In fact, I was able to access all the students, all the teachers, all the parents, first names, last names, <laughs> email addresses, physical addresses, login codes. You see, this was a problem. <laughs> I was also able to access something. Backpack has an API. They use it internally. And they integrate with other services, like Testinator. I was able to get the little key that I could use to access the API. So now I could finally get my timetabling data, which seems so small in, hi in hindsight. I had done something bad. I had just accidentally hacked every single school in the world, asterisk the ones that use Testinator and Backpack. I was panicking. I was freaking out. I didn't mean to do anything bad. I started off with good intentions. So I wrote an email. Wrote the email, and I said, hey, I found a security vulnerability in your website. This is how I found it. This is what I did. This is how I made sure I didn't access more data than I should have. I only accessed that of my friend and me. I deleted anything else I accessed. And I waited. I waited. I sent it, and I waited. The minutes felt like hours. The days felt like weeks. It actually, they responded in a couple hours. And they said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they were happy. I wasn't a bad guy. I, I was just sitting in my room. I wanted to work on a little project for design, and I got access to a little bit more than my timetabling data. <laughs> Did I add? I also had access to admin. I could uh, change my grades. I could change other people's grades. I could delete entire schools. <laughs> this leads me to my next lesson for you as a hacker. Bend, but maybe not break. Don't break. As a hacker, you have to be willing to experiment. You have to be willing to tinker. You have to be willing to push things as far as they can go. Don't push them too far. The reason I'm on this stage able to talk to you all is because I, I didn't. I didn't delete my school. I didn't change my grades. <laughs> so bend, but don't break. A good researcher, a good security researcher, a good hacker is not going to go and actually hack people. My next, my next tip is this. Chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Let me elaborate. This was Backpack. It was very secure. Testinator, on the other hand, had a couple holes. Put it more simply, a lock on a door is only as strong as the window next to it. Finally, I leave you with one thing. I know most of you aren't going to hack the world. You're not going to go become the next hacker or change the world. But I know that you can do one thing, and that's this. Be curious. Thank you. <laughs>